you all. Welcome to Portland Bible Church this evening. This is our Thursday night Bible study. I'm Pastor Gary Glennie. We're currently meeting here at our home in Vancouver, Washington. Thank you so much for joining with us. All those who are out there in the electronic area uh, all over the world, we thank you for joining with us. Those who are here in person or live streaming on Judy Glennie's Facebook page. Remember, you can also go to the website portlandbiblechurch.com at the top of the home page it has services and there's a drop down menu there you can link to youtube and you can do that anytime we have uh, the last almost three years of classes available on video on both youtube and on facebook it's judy glennie's my wife's facebook page we have classes tonight at seven o'clock on thursday after our class this evening we have our prayer meeting so if you have prayer requests Praises, thanksgiving, uh, give us a call, drop us a line. We'll be sure to include your praise or prayer request. On Sunday, we have class at 10 o'clock at 11.15. And after our second service in-house here, we sing the great hymns of the church for about a half hour or so. Just have a great time of worship and fellowship. So if you can join with us, if you're in the Portland, Vancouver area, drop by. We appreciate your uh, joining with us for prayer, fellowship, and worship on a Sunday or for Thursday if you can. Uh, my wife Judy has a class right here uh, at our home on Wednesday at two o'clock for the ladies and they're just getting ready to start uh, prophecy. So she's going to be doing a study of prophecy. This is a great, great thing that we need to understand because we're fast approaching the time that many of us believe our Lord will come back uh, to deliver us out of the nonsense in which we find ourselves. In the meantime, we need to do those things that are pleasing in his sight and so that we can have uh, a great report, if you please, at the judgment seat of Christ. At any rate, we, uh, we're here at, the, at the, our post, and we, do, uh, we study the whole Bible, every verse in the Bible, every time, all the time. I've been accused of being a voice crying in the wilderness, <clears throat> so I am. So thank you so much for joining with us. And uh, if, uh, just keep in mind that this Sunday we'll be having our communion service getting ready for the Resurrection Sunday events and the Passion Week, all of those things. So uh, if you can join with us, if you can, make sure you get some unleavened bread, some matzah and some uh, grape juice or Mogan David or whatever your uh, preference is for the cup. And you can take those elements with you, with us uh, at your home. So that's going to be this Sunday. Also, if you'd like to give to the Ministry of Portland Bible Church, you can do that. You can send it to me, but make sure you put Portland Bible Church on the envelope somewhere so that I put it in the box for our deacons to take care of that. And make sure that on the check you put Portland Bible Church so that they can deposit that in the church account uh, for the ministry. Remember, everyone according as they purpose in their own hearts, so let them give, not grudgingly, or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having everything and all sufficiency, you may have an abundance for every good work. We always take a few moments at the beginning of each of our Bible studies for silent prayer. This gives you the opportunity to spiritually clear the deck, so to speak, to acknowledge any sins that you're aware of. We believe this is essential to move us back into an area of fellowship so that we can understand the mind of Christ, which is the word of God. We usually refer to 1 John 1, 9, which says, if we believers confess our sins, that is name them, cite them, agree with God that their sins on a moment by moment basis, he, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, of course, based on the work of Christ and the cross, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We believe that picks up the ones that we forgot about or didn't even know that we had committed, and we believe that gives us restoration to fellowship so that we can understand the Word of God and the things of God. With that in mind, in preparation for our study this evening, let us pray. Now, Heavenly Father, we thank you once again that we have another opportunity to fellowship together, to fellowship in your word, to study, to understand those things that relate to who and what you are and your magnificent plan for us and the work of salvation provided by your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
We thank you for these things. We pray that you edify our souls this evening, challenge and motivate us by the things we study. We pray it all in the powerful and mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If my people are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Let my cry come before thee, O Lord, give me understanding according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. Thy word is truth. Study to show yourself, approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Open the word this evening to the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. For some time now we have been studying the epistle to the Ephesians. We finished up chapter 1. Seemed like quite a lengthy study, but that's because the first 14 verses have a great deal of theology. We have noted quite a few things in that connection. The fact that we are in the midst of the target of what the scripture indicates is the sphere of God's truth. So we looked at that. We looked at a brief on the heavens, and so we noted three heavens, and of course uh, we examined some of that. And we also looked at the study of eternal security, the fact that as believers in Jesus Christ, we never lose our salvation. We can lose rewards, we can come under discipline, but we never lose our eternal salvation through faith alone in Christ alone. Then we studied a section on election, and of course we did a debate uh, in-house against the hyper-Calvinist position, and of course we adhere to a free grace position as well, and so we understand these things. And then we began to study the doctrine of prayer. That was in connection with the verses in chapter 1, 15 through 23 of chapter 1, and this is the first great section of prayer that Paul has. He has another section of prayer in chapter 3, and we'll note that when we come to it. And so because of that, we decided to take some time and examine the doctrine, the uh, categorical understanding and presentation of prayer as it is found through the scriptures. And so as we began doing this, obviously we gave a definition. The definition is very simple. It's communication with God. It's our vertical communication. It's part of our priestly function. We study the Word of God, uh, and of course, uh, that's how He speaks to us, through His Word. We speak to Him through prayer. So prayer is just communication with God. We might say it's communion with God as well. It involves the mentality of the soul. It involves our free will. Most importantly, it's motivated by God's Word and uh, is handled and uh, instrumentally motivated by the Holy Spirit who lives in us and therefore in his indwelling presence and enabling or filling presence, he allows us to communicate with God. It's kind of an open channel, if you will. And then we looked at some categories of prayer. Uh, the first one is confession. That's why we take a few moments at the beginning of each class to acknowledge any sins that we're aware of. Immediately after that, we have thanksgiving, praise, adoration, basically the attributes of God as we extol who and what he is. Thanksgiving, matter of fact, one of the words for prayer is eucharisteo, uh, which is where we get the word eucharist, sometimes used to apply to the communion service. But the word actually means thanksgiving or good grace. And so we're giving good grace when we pray to God and when we take the communion, the Eucharist so-called. Many other words that we noted, and praise, of course, and thanksgiving, all of those are part of our adoration and honoring to God. From there on, we have intercession, which is our prayer on behalf of others, for the believers that we know, and also for the unbelievers that we may or may not know, so that they might have a clear understanding of the gospel, so that they might make a choice to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, petition and supplication for our own needs. Paul says pray about everything with prayer and supplication and make your request known with thanksgiving. He always adds the fact that when we pray, regardless of what we pray for, we always include thanksgiving. It's something that many times seems like it gets left out of our prayers because we usually get uh, in a situation where we say, God help 
and so we're in a jam or we have some great difficulty or adversity and so we uh, implore the Lord to help us but we need to always remember thanksgiving because we need to consider it all joy even when sometimes humanly speaking it's not joyous but to consider it joy and give thanks to God for all things and then make your petitions known. We looked at a number of Greek and Hebrew words. Those are all available as well as some of the Aramaic words. And then we went through some of the points. One of the major points, of course, is that uh, prayer is addressed to God the Father. We made a big issue out of this because even Jesus Christ himself told his disciples to pray this way, our Father who art in heaven. In fact, that's what led us into the Apostles' Prayer sometimes called the Lord's Prayer. It's actually a sample prayer, and so we took some time to look at it separately, and we'll pick it up there in just a moment. And so prayer, of course, is to the Father. That's the addressee of prayer in the name of the Son, because because we believed in Jesus Christ, we have direct access into the very presence, the throne room of God. And the instrumentality of the Holy Spirit is kind of the hookup. We might say he's the, he's the line of communication that is open to the Father, and he enables us. And sometimes even when we can't even pray, maybe we're hurting so bad physically or under some adversity, we can't even utter a prayer. Our heart is breaking, and the Holy Spirit prays and intercedes for us during those times. Of course, we noted the fact that uh, the, the Lord Jesus Christ prayed. Uh, we have prayers from the Holy Spirit, interestingly enough. And, of course, prayers from believers and even prayers from angels. We noted that as well. And, of course, uh, for the unbeliever, there really is no prayer for the unbeliever. The only thing an unbeliever can do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. At that point, he then has access or she has access to the Father through prayer. So prayer is really only something that believers have access to. It's one of the many avenues of access to the Father, just as the study of the Word of God. And then, of course, we had the intercessory prayer, point seven, and we started looking at that, and we noted several things uh, where we have the Old Testament prophet Elijah in 1 Kings 18. Uh, first, he prayed for the, the rain would stop, and then he prayed for the rain to come, and in each case, there was a, a prevailing prayer that was involved there. And so we see this many times when we have great adversity. And then, of course, the prayer there that we noted for the unbeliever, and we'll mention it several times, that the unbeliever can get a clear understanding of the gospel. I can't uh, overstate this because it seems like so many times today, even in churches and even evangelists in evangelistic outreaches, they do not make a clear presentation of the gospel. Time and time again, they add so many features to, to the gospel presentation that uh, if people become saved, it's hard to know if they really understood how they did get saved. It's ultimately by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. That's how you get saved. You don't have to spend a great deal of time. You just have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and his work on the cross, and you've got eternal salvation. There's no other hoops to jump through. You don't have to walk an aisle. You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to feel sorry for your sin. You don't even have to uh, make any type of uh, overt activity. You just mentally believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I know that flies in the face of many today because they are works oriented. In fact, all of the pagan religions of antiquity and many of the religions today, sadly, even many groups in Christendom add all kinds of works to salvation or to the gospel, either before you can get saved or after you get saved. We call that backloading. You're saved by faith alone, but... If you don't demonstrate that you're saved, we maybe think that you really weren't and you got to do it again. You got to work on it. And there's no work to be done. Jesus Christ did all the work on the cross. You can't add anything to it. You can't take anything away from it. You can only accept it and believe it. In fact, some of the people were asking Jesus, what can we do that we uh, work the miracles that uh, of God? And he said, this is the work of God. They want to know what work they had to do. And he said, this is the work of God, that you believe, which is the absence of work because Jesus did all the work. If you believe that he did the work of providing salvation, you have eternal life. That's it. No work you can do. Now, what about work? Well, production is what demonstrates that you have received 
salvation through faith in Christ. And of course, the Christian life is lived uh, as a demonstration of what you already possess. You may or may not demonstrate it, but that's what the Christian life is all about. And if you demonstrate well and are pleasing to the Lord, you receive additional rewards. Kind of reminds me of the service. When I was in the service, we have uh, decorations for all sorts of things. We have good conduct medals. Uh, we had sharpshooter medal medals, all sorts of excellence in uh, military tactics. And then, of course, uh, we have, if you get wounded, a purple heart uh, above and beyond the call of duty. Ultimately, we have the Medal of Honor. And so at the judgment seat of Christ, there will be decorations and rewards. Some five of them are mentioned in Scripture, and we've talked about it. This is for service as a believer, and of course, this can only be done once you've believed in Jesus Christ. Well, I digress, but let's go down to the point that we had uh, under consideration last time. And under point seven, it was letter F, a pattern for personal prayer. And while this is sometimes called the Lord's Prayer, some of you, if you're senior citizens, remember when we were in grade school, some even in junior high, when we actually could pray what they called the Lord's Prayer. Well, it never really was the Lord's Prayer. It's a sample prayer, and it's the prayer that the Lord told the disciples that they would use as a model prayer called the Lord's Prayer. If you want to know where the Lord's Prayer is, it's chapter 17, uh, just before he went out uh, to uh, uh, get arrested, before he uh, was arrested by the soldiers. And at the close of that Passover that he shared with his disciples, he had a rather lengthy prayer, chapter 17 of the Gospel of John. That's the Lord's Prayer. What is called the Lord's Prayer is a sample or an example. It's a pattern for prayer, and it's found in several places. It's found over in Matthew 6, 9 through 13, and also over in Luke. And in Luke, it's 11, 2 through 4. In Luke, it's kind of an abridged version, kind of a brief. The fuller version is in Matthew chapter 6, uh, 9 through 13. And I've chosen to go through and do a bit of exegesis in that prayer because I think it's so, so important. And it gives us a model for prayer. Now, it doesn't really include the concept of confession. We know that goes without saying. As a believer, we noted 1 John 1, 9, 1 Corinthians eleven thirty one, 31, another passage, Old Testament passages, uh, Psalm uh, 53, I believe it is, and 54, uh, where David uh, confesses his sin to God and God alone. And so we do confess our sin, but it addresses the bulk of the prayer, and that is addressing God uh, who is in heaven and uh, blessing to him, hallowing him, which it says, our Father who art in heaven, and therefore uh, hallowed, honored be thy name. We noted that already. Then we have a prophecy in the second verse, verse 10, thy kingdom come. That's a future tense idea there. It looks at the future uh, actually praying that the kingdom would come. That means the kingdom is not here now. There are some who teach in Christendom, kingdom now. They believe somehow we're in the millennial kingdom. Can you imagine such a thing? Look around you. Doesn't the world look like we're living in God's kingdom? Perfect peace on earth? I don't think so. At any rate, uh, we're not in the kingdom, but thy kingdom will come. We're going to be in that kingdom, reigning with Jesus Christ for a thousand years and on into eternity. And of course, it's described in Revelation, but more explicitly in Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48. If you want the details of what's going to go on in the millennial kingdom, Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48 is the greatest presentation that we have of the millennial kingdom in the future. Then it says, thy will be done. Looking again in the future. Is God's will done now? No, not necessarily. Oh, by believers on occasion, hopefully we're doing the will of God. But humanly speaking, the world and the most of the folks in the world are not doing the will of God. But in the future, they will do the will of God during the millennial kingdom. Some won't like it, but they're going to have to do it because he will be king of kings and lord of lords. And those who are disobedient may suffer uh, death uh, at the hands of the Lord at that time. And then it says uh, on earth as it is in heaven. That indicates that uh, the will of God is being done in heaven right now, but in the future it will also be done on earth. 
And then we move down to, if you've been with us in last class, if you missed that, you can go back and pick it up. And we see that the next section says, give us this day our daily bread. And this, of course, is the fact that God provides for us. And it simply is asking God, provide for us. Now, he does always provide for us, but this is something that we can pray about. Give us our daily portion, uh, and that's what it says here. Uh, give us this day our daily bread. Now, the word bread literally is food. It's metaphoric for all nourishment. Obviously, it would include water and beverage, but it also includes the word of God. Give us this day our daily bread. We see that bread from heaven uh, was in the time of Moses, come down and they ate of the bread of heaven. But when Jesus came down, he said what? I am the bread of life. And so when it says, give us this day our daily bread, it means give us the nourishment that comes from Jesus Christ, not just the physical sustenance, which is bread and other food and water, but the word of God. Give us this day because obviously he'll provide for us physical nourishment. That's his guarantee. But he gives the word of God, but do we provide for it? So here it is the fact that we're asking, give us our daily bread. Basically lead us to where we can be fed. Jesus is the great high shepherd and he feeds the sheep. You and I are his sheep, the sheep of his foal. And he feeds us as any good shepherd. But the shepherd has to lead the sheep into the place where there is green grass and clean water. And therefore, a pastor is kind of the under shepherd of the Lord Jesus Christ who instructs. Therefore, it behooves us as part of this prayer to be under a local pastor teacher and studying the word of God, getting the bread here described daily, daily, not just once a week, not just on Resurrection Sunday and Christmas and maybe a few other times when someone drags you into a church, daily. He said, well, I can't go to church every day. In the first century, they did. They had Bible class every evening in someone's upper room. This is traditional. This is historic. And so how can you do that? Well, you have Bibles. You have tapes. We have Internet. We have all sorts of things and resources that can allow you to get the bread of God, the bread of from heaven daily. And so we have this particular one. And uh, so I have here, give us this day our daily bread. And this, of course, uh, would have to do with not only the physical needs and the physical word of God, but also the fact that we have answers to prayer. We could probably include those as well. And then verse 12 is interesting. It says here, forgive us our debts. Some have translated it sins. And so we have several different words here that are used. Basically, there are two categories. Debts would be uh, the fact that we are indebted financially. But basically, the word debt in the Greek can also refer to trespasses and sins. And God does, at the moment of salvation, forgive every sin that we've ever committed. And so we have forgiveness of sins once and for all. But also, moment by moment, through 1 John 1, 9 and other passages, we are interested in fellowship and having the enabling of the Holy Spirit. So additionally, we ask for forgiveness of sins. It is interesting here that there's a caveat, forgive us our sins. Well, he's already done that. So this is for the believer moment by moment and day by day. He's talking to believers here. And therefore, he's saying, forgive us our debts. Well, they've already all been forgiven because they're believers. He's talking about their daily sins that they've committed and asking forgiveness for that. That's what we did at the beginning of class in 1 John 1, 9. But notice the caveat, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And so the caveat is that let's say you have someone who has sinned against you and you hold it against them. You confess your sins, but you have a grudge. You have unconfessed uh, you have not allowed someone uh, to acknowledge some wrong that they have done, and you, you hold it against them. And so you withhold forgiveness of other people. If you do not forgive other people, God will hold your daily forgiveness, and that, of course, will keep you in a state of perpetual carnality, and you will be neutralized in the Christian life. I remember years ago, I had a, an individual in one of my congregations that I serviced uh, quite a few years back, and this individual had gotten a divorce. <clears throat> 
and uh, he just could not forgive his ex. He just couldn't, and I kept telling him, you're, you're short-circuiting your prayer because you need to let it go. You need to forgive this person. I can't. I can't forgive my, they were just bad. They were just, I said, you've got to let it go <clears throat> because he had unforgiveness in his heart for other people who had hurt him or her, we'll say. Uh, in any case, God withheld forgiveness moment by moment. Now he's eternally secure. <clears throat> <clears throat> pardon me, could not lose his salvation, but moment by moment he had lost the forgiveness that comes through 1 John 1, 9, because even though he confessed his sins and was trying to acknowledge his sin, he had unforgiveness. So the scripture is clear. You will be forgiven as a believer as you forgive others. It's a comparative here. We have the comparative in the Greek, which indicates like manner. If you forgive other people of the things that they have done against you and you are forgiving, then anytime you ask for forgiveness, then God will forgive you. So in addition to 1 John 1, 9, and confessing your sins, you need to check yourself, and the Holy Spirit will bring this to your remembrance. Make sure you have no unconfessed for un, unforgiveness in your heart. You may say, well, I confess my sin, but I can't forgive so-and-so. Bad deal. You just lost your forgiveness, and so you are going to be in a state of carnality. You must be forgiving. Whether or not the person uh, ever forgives you is not the point. It's that you must forgive them. And so as a believer, forgiving other people when they've hurt you is essential as a believer. I cannot overstate this because it says it right here. And therefore, your forgiveness is conditional, not just on confessing, but on your forgiveness of others. If you have an unforgiven uh, heart about someone else, you better handle it and forgive that person, regardless if they ever forgive you, that isn't even the issue. All right, so that's this one here. Forgive us our trespasses or our debts as we forgive others. We see, for example, a number of passages that deal with this. I want to look at a couple of these. Uh, over in Hebrews 12, 15, we see the idea of let no root of bitterness spring up among you and defile you. A root of bitterness is when you have unforgiveness in your heart and therefore that causes bitterness. If you have bitterness, you remember in the book of Ruth, uh, was, uh, uh, was, uh, what, who was it? Naomi? Naomi, you know, she came back when she came back, uh, home and they asked her, they said, Oh, good to see you again, Naomi. And she said, what? Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. And that means bitter, bitter woman. Now she had lost her husband. She had lost her sons. All she had was this Moabite girl, Ruth, that tagged along with her. One of the two women that had married her uh, sons. And of course, she was bitter. Well, obviously, she was in big trouble at that time. Don't call yourself bitter. Don't become bitter. And so we see bitterness. When bitterness comes up with regard to other people, you neutralize your spiritual life and you neutralize any fellowship and prayer life that you might have. So we have that one. Then a couple of others I wanted to look at. And uh, obviously, uh, we see this just one verse down. Look at verse 14. For if you forgive men for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. And if you do not forgive men, then your Father uh, will not forgive your transgressions. So in other words, I wasn't making this up. In the next verse, 14 and 15, he goes through and explains this again in case you missed it the first time. So I wanted to emphasize that. Over in uh, uh, the book of Mark in chapter 11, over in Mark 11, 25. Mark 11, 25, it says, and whenever you stand praying, okay, here's a person, he's gonna pray, uh, and the uh, many people stand and they make long prayers. Oh, Father, oh, I love you so much. Oh, you know, they go through all this stuff. But it says, you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also, who is in heaven, may forgive you your transgressions. And so if you have anything against someone, you need to make sure that you deal with that and forgive that person, Mark 11, 25. And then in Luke, again in Luke, Luke chapter 11 and verse 4. So it's not just in one place. So this to me is very important as part of prayer. 
So when we're talking about the doctrine of prayer, don't forget thanksgiving and don't forget to forgive other people that you that may have offended you. Let it go. Let it go and forgive them, regardless of whether they accept your forgiveness or not. You need to forgive them. All right, so we have Luke chapter 4. I'm sorry. Yeah, Luke 11 and verse 4. Luke 11 and verse 4. Now, here is the parallel passage for the Apostles' Prayer. And you can see it's only three verses. So it's abbreviated. It doesn't have everything that the other one, but it does have this one in verse four. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and then lead us not into temptation. And he ends there uh, over in Luke. So we have this. Uh, a couple of other ones that are very important I wanted to add here, and that just so you have all of these Matthew chapter 18, 35. Matthew 18, 35. Here it says, So shall my heavenly Father also do to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. There it is. Forgiveness of others is essential, not only in the apostles' prayer that the Lord said, pray this way. Make sure when you ask for forgiveness that you have no one that you have not forgiven. Forgive others whatever they have done against you. And then again in verse 21 of earlier, here it says, uh, even Peter asked the question, and he came to the Lord and said, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? You know, it's like uh, and seven times, because seven was kind of the, the divine number, if you please. Uh, and so he figured, well, if my brother sinned against me and I forgive him seven times, when it gets to the eighth time, that's it. <laughs> no more forgiveness for you. And so it said, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but 70 times seven. And you're going, 70 times 7, how's my math? That's 490 times. Boy, that by the time you get to 490, you've forgotten how, how far you were. Obviously, he means you keep on forgiving over and over. 490 times. If you've forgiven your brother 490 times, then he, you know, the 491st, maybe, no, well, but that's the idea. Obviously, he's making, uh, almost making a joke here. Seven times? No. 70 times 7. He could have said 700 times 7 because the idea is you never stop forgiving your brother when he sins against you. I mean, that's on you because you end up getting the discipline and a failure to have spiritual momentum if you do not forgive other people. Doesn't matter whether they're believers or not, no matter how heinous it is, I know that's tough. Easy said, not so easy to do. But you want to shut down your spiritual life? You want to shut down access to God and prayer? Then just be an unforgiving person and you have neutralized your spirituality, your Christian life, and your prayer. Well, I think that's enough said there, but I wanted to emphasize that. So go back now to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6. And then it says here... Um, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, this usually is troublesome because people say, "Well, does God lead us into uh, does God lead us into evil? Does He lead us into temptation?" And of course, we can clearly go to the book of James, and it says, "God does not sin; He does not tempt us in. Yet God tests us and examines our heart, so He may bring us a test." We have noted that in the Greek, the verb pyrazo actually can be translated test or tempt. God does test us to see whether we will take it to the next step and be tempted. And the difference is testing is God's way of examining whether we will apply his word and his principle to our situation and adversity. If we do not apply God's word to our adversity and our situation, then we are tempted to have a human solution, try to solve our problem, or as they say, lift ourselves by our own bootstraps. In other words, try to do it ourselves. And you can't do it yourself because uh, you end up being tempted to solve it some other way than God's way through his word and through his promises. So the idea here, and by the way, this word for lead actually, um, Isonegkes actually would mean let us not succumb or do not abandon us to temptation. In other words, temptation comes 
when we do not apply God's word and therefore he tests us, but it doesn't become temptation until we abandon God's word and God's promises and begin to apply our own human resources and energy of the flesh. And it says, do not abandon us to temptation. Do not let us succumb to temptation. God does not lead you into temptation. He may bring you a test, but he doesn't let you succumb to temptation. If you pray, don't let me succumb to the temptation. Keep me close, Father. So that's a much better way to translate that. And I noted James uh, uh, 1.13, which says, God does not tempt us to sin and does not sin. He's not the author of sin. We also see it over in Mark. We might look at Mark 14. Don't think we were there. Mark 14.38. Find it. Mark 14 and 38. Here it says in Mark 14, 38, keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. In other words, you pray that you would not come into temptation. That is to allow a test that God meant for you to have spiritual advance. And instead of spiritually advancing, you say, well, I got to solve this problem myself. And how many times has something happened? And we say, now what am I going to do? We need to say, now what are you going to do, God? And yet many times our old sin nature will say, now what am I going to do in this situation? Instead of saying, claim the promises of God. He will never forsake you or leave you. He will always be there. And so obviously it says, keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. You will take the test, you will apply promises of God, principles from God, and pass the test. You will not succumb, you will not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, it says, but the flesh is weak. We know that the word flesh is certainly our human nature, but more than that, many times it's addressed as our old nature, the nature before we have been regenerated and have a new spiritual nature. We fall back on our old nature. I got to solve this problem. I don't know when God's going to come in, but I got to stop. Stop right now. Not what am I going to do? What are you going to do, God? I've got this situation. What are you going to do? Not what am I going to do? I can't do anything about it. You have energy of the flesh. It may lead you into temptation. So uh, this Mark 14, 38, great passage. And then we have, uh, that's the only negative one in the, in the prayer. It's the only negative one. Do not lead us, or I like, do not let us succumb to temptation. Do not abandon us to temptation. Uh, and in this verse in 38, we noted here uh, that we may not come into temptation. And then he says, but positive, deliver us from the evil. I like this because we see here, some of you as uh, students now of the original language, I've given you a number of principles with related to the Greek and Hebrew, and a principle here is that we have the definite article. And so as we go into Matthew uh, chapter 6 and this passage, which says here, if I can get there, uh, deliver us from evil. And they have a marginal note here in the New American Standard in verse 13. And you can look over there. And if you have a New American Standard, see what it says. The evil one. Now, what I'm suggesting is that, and not suggesting, I'm telling you, there's a definite article there. So deliver us from the evil. Well, the evil would be some specific evil. But many times it's a reference to Satan himself, the evil one. So the word evil itself is an adjective describing uh, certain activities, evil activities, or an evil person, or Satan himself who is the evil one. In any case, it refers to, in this passage, deliver us from the evil, the evil one. And that's a positive. So we have the negative, do not let us succumb, do not abandon us to temptation, do let us come into temptation, but rather positive, deliver us from the evil one or the evil thing, whatever it is, I submit that it's the evil one. That's what the New American Standard translates in the margin, which I like that because many times they will do what the original Greek has, even though we quote it differently. All right, now, as we look at this passage, we see that verse 13 uh, says here, uh, 
let's see, verse 13b says, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I don't know if you're old enough to remember saying that in grade school. I remember doing it just as every morning we did that as our exercises when the class uh, in homeroom uh, and we would uh, we would pray that so-called Lord's Prayer. We would salute the flag and uh, recite the Pledge of Allegiance. And this is what we would quote. However, the more ancient manuscripts do not have this portion. And so we see that in the uh, many of the more later manuscripts, we actually see this. So this is one of those contended, uh, uh, contentious points. Is this in the original autograph? Is this really what Jesus said? The most ancient manuscripts do not have this last part, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Is there anything wrong with that? Certainly not. Uh, we find it, as a matter of fact, uh, over in First Chronicles 29, 10 through 18, all this information is there. So it seems that some of the later scribes, as they were writing this down, either uh, for whatever reason incorporated this because they thought it rounded out the prayer. Now, I'm not saying that it's not part of the Bible. No one really knows. Many, many smaller, later manuscripts have this and parts of this. But the more ancient manuscripts, the oldest ones we have, do not have it. Is the theology good? I have no problem with it. We'll go through it because it's over in First Chronicles 29, 10 through 18. It is biblical. But whether or not it's actually part of what Jesus said to the disciples is debatable. So it won't change your salvation. And when we were kids, we recited the whole thing and never thought about it. But I noted here, I went, whoa, this wasn't in the ancient manuscript. In fact, it even says in the New American Standard, this clause is omitted in the earliest manuscripts. So right there, they noted it. And I looked at the earliest manuscripts, and sure enough, it wasn't there. But it's in a lot of later ones. So either they felt that it ought to be there, or maybe that's what the Lord actually said. And so the debate goes on. Well, we'll look at it. For thine is the kingdom. Is it not? Is God's kingdom not thy kingdom? Thy is your. We might say, for yours is the kingdom. And this kingdom is not the millennial kingdom. This is God's eternal kingdom. God is in control of the universe. Temporarily, the earth is, as it were, out of commission because Satan has usurped the authority over the earth. He's the prince of the power of the air. But, of course, we can override that through regeneration, faith in Christ alone, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit because greater is he who is in us than you than he who is in the world. But the world still temporarily has been the authority usurped by Satan, but God is still in control of the entire universe, and at the millennium, he will rectify when Jesus Christ becomes King of kings and Lord of lords. So the universal kingdom, as Dr. Chafer uh, in his systematic theology called it, the universal kingdom of God is the kingdom that God has of the entire creation, and that is intact, and it's his kingdom. Yours is the kingdom. So I have no problem with this whatsoever. It's God's eternal kingdom, but not just the millennial kingdom. We saw that earlier, thy kingdom come. That was the millennial kingdom. This is thy kingdom. Here it says, yours is the kingdom, eternal kingdom, and the power and the glory. The power, of course, dunamis in the Greek has to do with God's inherent power, kind of like dynamite. Uh, it's there anytime you need it, but you need something to set it off. And God can set it off, and he did that when he created the universe. He spoke, and the universe sprang into existence. And God can do it in a heartbeat anytime, any place, because of his power. We might equate this, this inherent power to his omnipotence. God is all-powerful. Other words like kratos uh, is used for omnipotence. But I think in this passage, dunamis will do the job of God's omnipotence. So yours is the kingdom and the omnipotence, the power, and the glory. The Greek word doxa is glory and God's effulgence, his shekinah, his presence has an illumination that is brilliant. It was so brilliant that Moses could not even look at it. It would have blinded him. So God put him in the cleft of the rock and said, I'll let my glory 
pass by and uh, you'll see my after trail. And of course that was reduced to a uh, physician when it was seen in the cloud, a pillar of cloud uh, by day and the pillar of fire by night. That was a visual presence of the Lord Shekinah glory. Ezekiel saw it, and he saw one sitting on a platform within the Shekinah glory uh, during the uh, introduction to the book of Ezekiel. We've looked at that before. So the glory is the effulgence and the Shekinah of God. The Shekinah is the dwelling presence of God forever. That speaks for itself. We have unto the ages, Istus Ionas, unto the ages, it of course is plural, unto the ages of the ages, meaning forever is how we translate it. And then we have the great closing of a prayer, amen. That's how we say it. The Hebrews would say amen and uh, omen. And this, of course, in Hebrew, actually in the adverbial form means truly or verily or so be it. Often we say the amen is I believe it, so be it. And so this is how it's closed. And this, of course, is the Apostles' Prayer. Well, no extra charge for that. I thought that would be not only interesting, but essential as we study through the doctrine of prayer. How's our time? Oh, my goodness. Well, that exhausted our time, and so we're going to have to come back, and we'll be able to finish the doctrine of prayer, I believe, next class. And so we will continue at that point next time. Father God, thank you so much for your word that lives and abides forever. Thank you for the, this magnificent prayer that you gave to your apostles, a prayer that even today we can exercise. The principles are there. We need to be forgiving of those who have sinned or violated us and hurt us in some way so that our prayer life and our spiritual growth is not hampered in any way and that you would help us to stay uh, f out of temptation by taking any examples or tests that you give us and applying your word, your principles, and your promises to it. And we pray, Father, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And for that one person who's here today, this evening, without Christ, without hope, without eternal life, we want you to know God had you in mind when he sent his son Jesus Christ, the second member of the Trinity, undiminished deity, placed into body through the virgin birth, true humanity, and therefore as a sinless human being, Jesus Christ became the absolute final and perfect sacrifice for the sins of every member of the human race. That's the issue in salvation. That's the issue in the gospel. What will you do with Jesus Christ? Do you believe in him? Do you believe he was the God-man and the savior of mankind? Most important, do you believe he is your savior? You can express that right now in your soul. Simply say, I'm believing in Jesus Christ. And you can put it into a prayer. Father, I'm believing in Christ. Thank you that he died on the cross for my sins. Thank you for forgiving my sins. Thank you for giving me everlasting life. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. God so loved the world that he gave his uniquely called, his uniquely appointed, his uniquely born of a human virgin, his uniquely created son in the human, human body uh, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish eternally, but have everlasting life. Won't you do it before you leave? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Again, Father, thank you for this opportunity, this marvelous passage, all of these passages that relate to our prayer life. Thank you for these things, and we pray it in the powerful and majestic name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.